first video, Introduction to Visual Representations of Imaging, What Makes a Great Mix, introduces you to our framework for displaying sounds visually. We'll map out how each piece of equipment in the control room affects imaging, the apparent placement of sounds between the speakers. We begin by mapping out the space between the speakers. Then we'll explain the mapping of sound to visuals. Once we have built a visual framework, we can then use it to explore all of the different types of mixes in the world. Then you'll have a good perspective on which to base your own values. The second video, Visual Representations of Studio Equipment, is an overview of the basic functions of each piece of equipment in the studio. Using the visuals, we will explore some of the most basic functions of reverb, delays, flanging, choruses, compression, and noise gates. Doing this serves a couple of purposes. First, you learn the basic functions of the equipment. Second, you get to know the details of mapping of audio functions to visuals so that when we show mixes in real time, you can see them in more detail. Also, this will make it easier to explain subtle details in mixes. Now that we have visually mapped out all the equipment in the studio, in the third video, Musical Dynamics Created in the Control Room, we can now show how all of the equipment can be used together to create different styles of mixes. We can show the common structures of mixes used for different styles of music and different types of songs. Once you see all that can be done in the studio to create different types of mixes, it gives you a perspective on all the possibilities available. Hi, my name is David Gibson. I know everything about recording. I've been doing it since the beginning of time. Of course, this isn't true. No one knows everything about recording. Because every session, every project is a completely new experience. It's kind of like life. You never know what you're going to get. We can only do the best with each situation. And who knows what the best is? There's no god of recording out there grading us. Therefore, I'm not here to tell you how to record a certain way. Each mix should be based on the song you're mixing. I'm not here to tell you how to mix like me. I'm here to help you to prepare yourself to handle the most unlikely type of situation possible. I'm not going to tell you the one way to mix. I want to show you different ways that people mix so you will have a choice. I'm here to help you do the most difficult job of all to make art out of technology. My main goal is to give you a perspective on how it all works together, how you use technical equipment to create art. Then we will explore the different values that different people have for recording and mixing, different styles of music and song. Music 
This video is designed to teach you how to mix each and every style of music. Now, this is a grand task. We're not here to teach you our own values for what makes a great mix. We only want to give you a perspective on what is possible so you can be creative on your own. Each and every song is mixed differently based on the song and style of music. Therefore, we won't simply mix a song and say, this is the way it's done. Instead, what we'll do is point out the common values that different people hold for mixing different styles of music. Each style of music has developed its own traditions for the way it has been mixed throughout the history of recording. For example, big band music, heavy metal, acoustic jazz, even rap and hip hop have developed certain traditions in the way they've been mixed. This video has been designed to answer that elusive question, what makes a great mix? And how do you go about creating a great mix? You see, the big question is, once you know what all the equipment in the studio does, how do you use it to create a good mix? After you know what the knobs do, which way do you turn them? We'll show you a framework for explaining what a good mix is. Then we will use this framework to see what professional engineers are doing in the songs we like and you like. With such a framework, we can develop our own values for what makes a great mix. This video is not meant to tell you how to mix a song a particular way because a mix is dependent on so many variables. The song and all of its details, the style of music, and the people involved. Instead, this video is designed to give you a structural framework which you can use to categorize all of the different structures of mixing. The structure of a mix. Hmm. What a concept. Finally, someone's mapped out the underlying structure of what you can do in a mix. Wow, did you hear what he said? Yeah. You know, I know what I like, but I never know how to get it when I'm in the studio. I had a good mix once, but I can never remember how I did it. Yeah. Check it out, man. I think he's on to something. The players know what's up, though, man. We know what's tight. Why can't we ever get it right in the studio, then? <laughs> perspective. Wonderful. Finally, a perspective on everything that goes into recording and mixing. Once you have this visual framework down, you can then begin to build your own perspective on how different songs are mixed. And once you start checking out the details of exactly what other engineers are doing, then you develop your own values as to what you like for each style of music. All values are valid. The only possible evil is having no values at all. We're not here to tell you you should mix things a certain way. We're here to help you develop and remember your own values. And we're here to do it visually, because visuals can help us to remember. What did he say? Oh, I forget. Bring on the visuals. I like it when I can see what's happening. Many people are visually oriented. Wow! <laughs> the colors are great! This is the way learning should be! Is it worth a thousand cents? <laughs> In order to be able to explain and show different styles of mixes, let's map out how each piece of equipment affects imaging, the apparent placement of sounds between the speakers. Just about everyone has experienced the perception of sounds in a stereo mix as coming out of one speaker or the other, or somewhere in between the speakers. Now, if we pan a sound 
all the way over to the right, it's never going to come further right than the right speaker, right? <laughs> but sometimes, you know, you hear it coming from other places in the room if you've got a really weird room or if the walls are strange. But in a studio, you would never hear it further right of the right speaker. Now, if we pan it to the left, no matter how far you pan it to the left, it will never sound further left of the left speaker. Some people think it's only going to sound this far left. Some people see it a couple of inches or even a foot further left of the left speaker. So therefore, we can draw boundaries just to the left of the left speaker and just to the right of the right speaker. So panning is mapped out as left to right. When I turn the pan pot here, you can hear the sound pan from left to right and from right to left, like that. Now we're not talking about reality here. Wow. Now we're not talking about reality here, because you see, there's actually no sound between the speakers. The reality is, the sound comes out of the speakers in waves travels through the molecules into the room, hits the walls in the room, and it also hits your ears and your body. This is one way we perceive sound. Another way we perceive sound is we imagine it to be between the speakers. This is called imaging. It's a figment of our imagination. You see, when we hear a sound between the speakers, there's no sound really there. The truth is, the same sound's just coming out of both speakers. And we imagine the sound to be between the speakers. It's just a figment of your imagination. Like an audio optical illusion. Also, you know when you hear a sound in the middle of your head? When listening to headphones? Well, there's no sound there. Your brain's there. Cool. Even if you are asleep, sounds still hit your body and it affects you. On the other hand, if you aren't paying attention to a mix or if you're off to the side of the speakers, you don't hear imaging. When you're asleep, imaging does not exist. In fact, they've done studies of people who don't hear imaging because of the shape of their ears or because of the shape of their minds. <laughs> imaging is a figment of our imagination. In fact, there is no imaging in the forest. Different people relate to sound in these two ways. Many people just feel the sound and perceive the music that way. Other people actually see the imaging between the speakers. Recording engineers are often obsessed by these dynamics that go on in this imaginary world of imaging. with our mapping of mixing functions into the visual world. What about faders or volume controls? As you have probably noticed in some mixes, some sounds are right out front, normally vocals and lead instruments, while other instruments like strings and background vocals are often in the background. We'll map out volume as a function of front to back. This makes sense because louder sounds are normally closer to us and softer sounds are commonly further away. Also, if we want to sound like a vocal to be out front in a mix, what do you do? Turn it up! Right. If you want something out front, turn it up. If you want something in the background, turn it down. I guess that's why they call them background vocals.
Although volume is the number one function of front-to-back placement, there are other pieces of equipment or factors that make the sound seem more upfront, such as compressor limiter, boosting EQ in the mid-range or high-frequency range, short delays of less than 30 milliseconds, that's fattening, and any effect that makes a sound sound unusual so that it sticks out. On the other hand, reverb and long delay times tend to make sounds more distant. Well, distant thunder could be miles behind the speakers, right? However, this illusion is created from our past experience of thunder. Normally, we don't seem to hear sounds more than a short distance behind the speakers. Normally, background vocals and strings are only a few inches behind the speakers, right? Well, check it out around your own speakers. Different people do disagree as to how far behind the speakers they hear the sounds. Who am I to say your imagination sucks? Now, no matter how loud you make a sound in a mix, sounds will never seem to come from more than a short distance from in front of the speakers. No matter how loud you turn up the sounds, the sounds will never come from here, and sounds will never come from behind you. Unless you have a 3D sound processor. Yeah, but that's a whole nother world, and video. This distance we imagine the sound to be in front of or behind the speakers is based on a couple of factors. First, the larger the speaker, the further in front the sound appears to be. Small studio speakers about six inches, a huge PA that's about 10 feet, or a boombox is just two or three inches. The second factor that determines the difference in the way people perceive the limits of imaging from front to back has to do with the fact that some people have a more active imagination than others. And than others. And than others. And than others. Now, one day, I noticed that high frequencies appear higher between the speakers, and low frequencies appear lower. Bells, cymbals, and strings seem to be right about here, whereas bass guitars and kick drums seem to be right about here. Check it out on your own system. Play a song and listen to where high frequency sounds, sounds seem to be and where low frequency sounds seem to be between the speakers. Most people agree highs are higher and lows are lower. That's probably why they call highs high and lows low. There are a number of reasons why this illusion exists. First of all, tweeters are often higher than woofers. But also, low frequencies come through the floor to your feet. High frequencies never come through the floor. Um, some studios are even calibrated as to exactly how many low frequencies come through to your feet. Another reason, though, is that we've got a low frequency resonator here, boosting the low frequencies, and we've got a high frequency resonator here, boosting the high frequencies. Singers, when they learn how to sing, are often taught if they want to bring out the lows, you know, sing from down here, okay? So, we have lows here, highs here. On a more esoteric level, there are energy centers that have been mapped out. These energy centers are called chakras. At the base of our spine, they say it's 40 hertz. Around here is maybe around 800 hertz, 1,000 hertz, 5,000. So whether this is real or not, but at any rate, it's, it's, it helps explain very likely low frequencies lows. Regardless of why it happens, the truth of the matter is that high frequencies do seem to appear higher between the speakers than low frequencies. Therefore, we'll put the high frequencies up high and we'll put the low frequencies down low in all of our visuals.
Now, no matter how high the frequencies in a sound, they'll never come from higher than the speakers themselves. I mean, they never come from the ceiling, right? You see, imaging is limited to the top of the speakers. Now, since bass frequencies come through the floor, the lower limit is down here, the floor, where the floor is. So check it out. No matter how far we pan the sound to the left, it's only gonna go about this far. It's gonna be a little bit in front of the speakers, a little bit behind the speakers, and to the top of the speakers. Then all the way across to the top, a little bit front, a little bit behind, down to the floor, all the way to the right speaker, about right here. Okay? So you can imagine this three-dimensional space right there. Now, this is a limited space between the speakers where a mix occurs. It only happens in this space right here. Therefore, if you have a whole lot of instruments, it's going to be crowded. Say you got a hundred piece, piece orchestra, you put a hundred instruments between these speakers and there's hardly any room, so it's hard to, to differentiate between every single sound. Whereas you put three violins between the speakers and you can hear every one completely separate from each other because there's only so much space between the speakers here where you can create a mix. Therefore, the whole issue becomes that of crowd control. The ranges of control that an engineer has are the same as those of the sculptor. Both are working in three dimensions. We have now mapped out the space between the speakers where imaging occurs. This is a stage or a palette where we can create different structures of mixes. Now let's discuss the elements that we can place between the speakers. Years ago, I started out with a dot on my Macintosh in the program Mac Paint. I figured if I moved the dot left and right, it was like panning. However, after a while, I realized that you can commonly have two sounds in the same spot between the speakers and still hear both of the sounds. Therefore, I got a 3D program so that I could make the images be see-through or transparent. Now, using the equipment in the studio, we can place any sound anywhere in the 3D stereo field with volume faders, pan pots, and EQ. With panning, we can move a sphere left and right. With volume, we can move the sphere front to back. With equalization, we can move the sound up and down, at least a little bit. Of course, no matter how much bass we add to a piccolo, we'll never be able to get it to rumble the floor. And we won't be able to put a bass guitar in the sky. But if we are mapping out pitch as a function of up and down with EQ, we can raise the sound up or down at least a little bit. So, as you see, we can place the sound anywhere between the speakers in 3D with volume, panning, and EQ. Now the whole goal here is to show how much space each sound takes up between the speakers so we can deal with the big problem of masking. Just how big is each sound in this world of imaging? This is important because sometimes one sound will hide another sound when they are in the same place. Therefore, if this is a limited space between the speakers, we need to know how big each member of the crowd is, right? First, bass instruments seem to take up more space between the speakers, so we make them big. Think about it. Put three bass guitars in a mix, and what do you have? Hip hop? Yeah, but in any other style of music, you end up with Mud City. I mean, you put three bass guitars in a mix, and it fills up the space between the speakers completely. On the other hand, put 10 bells in a mix, and even if they're all playing at the same time, you can hear every single one individually. Because bass instruments are bigger in the world of image, and they mask other sounds more, 
They hide other sounds in a mix, especially when turned up loud. Also, louder sounds will appear larger because of perspective. This also rings true because louder sounds do mask other sounds more. A guitar that is extremely loud in a mix will tend to mask the other sounds more than if it were soft in the mix. Besides round spheres, we also have oblong spheres. This is an unusual effect that happens when we put a delay on a sound less than 30 milliseconds. One, one thousand, thousand milliseconds, milliseconds equals, equals one, one, one second. Second, 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 second. When you have a delay longer than 30 milliseconds, you hear an echo like this. However, when you have a delay less than 30 milliseconds, our ear is not quick enough to hear the difference between the two sounds, so we only hear one sound, one fat sound. When you place the original signal in the left speaker, then put the delayed signal in the right speaker, it's as if it stretches the sound between the speakers. It doesn't put the sound in a room like reverb, it just makes it omnipresent between the speakers. Just as volume panning and EQ can be used to place and move spheres, we also have control over the placement of this line of sound created by fattening. We can place the line anywhere from left to right using pan pots, up front or in the back using volume, or even move it up or down a little bit with EQ. When we place reverb in a mix, we are placing the sound of a room in the space between the speakers. A room being three-dimensional is shown as a three-dimensional see-through cube between the speakers. Again, with reverb, we can place it anywhere in the 3D stereo field using panning, volume, and EQ. We now have defined and visualized the basic tools that an engineer uses to sculpt this three-dimensional space between the speakers, spheres, lines, and rooms. With them, the engineer can design a wide range of structures ranging from sparse mixes to full mixes to asymmetrical mixes to symmetrical mixes, to a mix with a lot of movement. As previously mentioned, the art of mixing is the creative placement and movement of these sound images. Just as a musician needs to explore and become thoroughly familiar with all of the possibilities of his or her instrument, so must an engineer be aware of all possible musical dynamics that the equipment can create. And he or she must be adept at coming up with any structure of mix that can be conceived. Mixes can be transparent or invisible. Some styles of music have traditionally been made to be invisible so you don't hear the mix, like acoustic jazz, bluegrass, or folk music. On the other hand, the mix could be quite visible. In some styles of music, engineers often use the equipment in the studio to create musical dynamics. The mix is utilized almost like another instrument in the song. Regardless of the style of music, the one thing we can all agree on is that the mix should be appropriate for the song. The mix should fit the song like clothing suits your personality. The mix can be used as a tool to enhance the song and highlight certain aspects. Or it can be used to create tension or chaos 
when appropriate. Regardless of how it fits, the mix should fit the style of music and song in some way. The creative engineer pushes the limits of what has already been done. Now that we have defined the space between the speakers where imaging occurs, and that now that we have outlined some of the basic parameters of sound visually, the big question is, what makes a great mix? And how do you obtain it? Obtain it. Obtain it. Well, in order to answer this question, we need to figure out what can be done in a mix in the first place. The first question is, what tools do we have to make different types of mixes? What are the tools we have to create the dynamics an engineer creates? Well, as previously shown, we have volume, panning, EQ, and effects. These are the tools you use to create a mix. Now, there are many other things that contribute to a great recording that can be refined during the recording session. These dynamics of the song include concept, melody, harmony, rhythm, the lyrics, the song structure, the arrangement and instrumentation, the band's performance, and the quality of the recording and the equipment. The mix is only one aspect of a recorded piece of music. All of these other aspects must be at least okay at a basic level of good quality. The mix can be used to hide some of the weaker aspects, but there's only so much you can do. Tools are their best when they're invisible. Focus on the hammer, hit your finger. Look at the steering wheel, crash the car. Stare at the knobs, screw up the mix. Get lost in the equipment, so much for the art. You know what I mean. You can't see the forest through the trees. It is the music that counts, not the equipment. Learn your tools well, so you can get past them into the beauty of the music at hand. So what makes a great mix? You know, the bad mix. It's just happening. You feel it. It's there. Mm. Well, I like a mix when things are overlapping and like once in a while, some things just seem to bubble up and peek their heads through. I like a full perspective. I want to see small next to big, clarity next to fullness, emotion next to thought form. I want to see a full perspective. So uh, what makes a great mix? When you play it anywhere, it sounds good. So when it's booming, it's all bad. Oh, that's the one. A great mix is full of cool effects. Something happening every moment. It's true. One person's heavenly mix is another one's help, and vice versa. It takes all types for the world to go around. You know what I mean? Yet, throughout all mixes, there are certain values that are commonly held. We don't like muddiness, at least not for too long. And we don't like too many irritating frequencies. Even punk rockers have their limits. And we like our highs, high frequencies that is. There are similar values that have come to be commonly accepted for each style of music. For example, in big band music, turn up the kick drum too loud, they'll kill you. Likewise, if you don't turn up the kick drum really loud in heavy metal and rap, they'll kill you too. But still, within each style of music, there are people that have differing opinions as to how the mix should be. Some people do it the opposite of what is normal, just to be different. 
And about the only thing that anyone can agree on in this business is that the mix is appropriate for the style of music and appropriate for the song and all of its details. Just as the song dictates the mix, it is the personality of the entity that dictates the way it is clothed. It is the way that the equipment relates to the song that makes a great mix. The function of all this technical equipment is to enhance the music in some way. Songs have many dynamics in them, spanning the entire range of perception, from feelings and emotions to thought forms, physical reactions, visual imagery, spiritual connotations, and cultural connotations. There's a wide range of possible dynamics that music evokes in different people. The mixing board and all of the equipment in the studio can also create musical dynamics that also affect us in similar musical ways. The art of mixing is the way in which the dynamics we create with the equipment in the studio interface with the dynamics apparent in songs. Making the relationship of these dynamics work is the art of the recording engineer. The first video in the series was designed as an introduction to our visual framework for representing sounds in a mix. In this video we have covered, and you've learned, that we perceive sounds in a mix two ways. One, we feel the sound waves hitting our ears and our body. Second, we imagine the sounds between the speakers. This is imaging, the apparent placement of sounds between the speakers. We also learned about the limits of imaging. First, you normally don't hear sounds further left or right of the speakers themselves. Second, you don't hear sounds more than a couple of feet in front of or behind the speakers. And you don't hear sounds much higher than the speakers themselves. But we do hear sounds come through the floor. We also learn that this is a limited space between the speakers. When you have a lot of sounds in the mix, they fill up the space causing masking. With only a few sounds in the mix, there is plenty of room and they sound clearer. Therefore, it all becomes a function of crowd control. We also learn that you can move sounds around in this three-dimensional space between the speakers with panning, volume, and EQ. Then, we discussed delays and how you can stretch the sound between the speakers, making it fatter, although it does take up more space in the mix. We discussed reverb and how it takes up a ton of space between the speakers, and how it can be moved around in the mix. Then, we gave you an introduction of what is to come in future videos, as we briefly discussed different structures of mixes. We discussed how the mix should fit the style of music and the details of the song. And we ended by showing how the dynamics that we can create with the technical equipment relate to the dynamics found in the music itself. Hi there. 
It's important to understand the basic functions of each piece of equipment in the studio. But the thing that is really important is how all of the equipment works together to create different styles of mixes. That is, how all the equipment works together to create good mixes, rather, great mixes. We will then have a framework for the discussion of different values for different types of mixes. Then we can have some really good arguments. We'll actually have something to argue about. In this video, we will explain the basic functions of all of the equipment in the studio. Using visuals of sounds, we will explain the most common parameters found in each piece of equipment. This video is an introduction to the basic functions of equipment. The idea is to explain each piece of equipment visually, so that in the next video, we can use these visuals to show different types of mixes. We will go into more detail on each piece of equipment in future videos. In order to make the huge variety of studio equipment fathomable, let's categorize all of the equipment based on its function in the recording process. Sound creators create sound. These include acoustic to electric instruments, from vocals to synthesizer. Sound routers route sound from one place to another. Mixing boards route the signal to four places, the multi-track, the speakers, the headphones for the band out in the studio, and the effects so we can have a good time. Patch bays are just the back of everything in the studio next to each other. It's the back of the mix panels, the back of the multi-track ins and outs, back of the console ins and outs, and back of the effects ins and outs. It's the back of everything next to each other so we can use short cables to connect everything in the studio. Sound stores store sound. Tape players store digital or analog sound. Sequencers store MIDI information. Sound transducers are equipment that take one form of energy and change it into another form of energy. Microphones take mechanical energy or sound waves and change them into electrical energy. Speakers take electrical energy and change them into mechanical energy or sound waves. But it is sound manipulators that we are here for. This includes effects and processing that are used to change or add to a sound after it has been created. Now, there are only three components to sound, volume or amplitude, frequency and time. That's all she wrote. Every single sound in the world can be described fully and completely by these three components. Therefore, every piece of equipment in the studio controls one or more of these three parameters. Here's a chart showing all the sound manipulators in the studio. Volume of the faders is shown as a function of front to back. Frequency is shown as a function of up and down. Time is shown in real time. That is, when a sound occurs, the visual representing that sound will appear and flash. In the first video of the series, we showed how we mapped out volume as a function of front to back. As previously mentioned, we can use volume faders to place a sound out front, in the background, or anywhere in between. In the next video, we will cover how volume relationships can be used to create different musical dynamics. When we set volume relationships in a mix, we use apparent volumes to decide on the relative balance, not just the voltage of the signals going through the fader. If we were just using where the faders are set relative to each other, then we could mix without even listening. We could look at the faders and place them based on their relative placement, like this. When we raise the faders on the board, we are changing the voltage of the signal being sent to the amp, which boosts the wattage, which then sends more power to the speakers, which create more sound pressure level in the air that our ears hear. However, there's more to it than that. The other main thing that affects apparent volume is the waveform of the sound itself. For example, a chainsaw will sound louder than a flute 
when they're both exactly the same volume on the VU meters. A screaming electric guitar sounds louder than a clean guitar sound, even if they're both at exactly the same volume. So when you see sounds represented by spheres between the speakers, you're seeing the apparent volume of a sound. This is what we use to mix with. This is what we use to set volume relationships. You don't look at the faders, you listen for the relative volumes. Also, as previously mentioned in the first video, panning is naturally mapped out as left to right. If we think of the space between the speakers as a palette on which to place instruments left to right, we are free to pan as we please. However, particular styles of music seem to have developed a tradition for placement of particular instruments left to right in the stereo field. Obviously, Movement of a pan pot during a mix creates an especially effective dynamic. We will discuss the common ways that panning is used to create musical dynamics in the next video. Compressor limiters are volume functions. Their main purpose is to turn the volume down. Compressor limiters turn the volume down when the volume goes above a certain threshold. When the volume is below a certain threshold, the compressor limiter does nothing unless broken or cheap. The two main functions of a compressor limiter are one, to get less noise on tape, a better signal to noise ratio. This is accomplished by compressing the signal on the way to the multitrack. And two, to stabilize the sound between the speakers. The first function, to get less hiss from tape, is the original reason that compressor limiters were first introduced into the studio. Let me explain it this way. Say I'm humming along at a low volume, then all of a sudden it gets really loud. Do, 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 do. <laughs> well, the problem is, Unless we turn down the fader, we're going to get distortion. And you can't have distortion. Get distortion, go to jail. So, you turn the volume down. But then, the low volume humming barely moves the needles on the tape player. And as you know, if the needles barely move, you hear as much tape noise as you do signal. It's called a bad signal to noise ratio, and it kind of sounds like <laughs> So. You turn down the peaks and then raise the overall volume above the noise on the tape, getting less hiss. The second function of a compressor limiter is to stabilize the image of the sound between the speakers. Check it out. When a bunch of sounds are bouncing up and down like VU meters, it can get to be extremely chaotic. But if we stabilize one of the sounds, it's easier to focus on it. Therefore, it seems more present just because our mind can focus on it. It's more stable. Now, if you stabilize all of the sounds in the mix, the whole mix will seem more present or clearer. There are two main things that determine how much you compress. The more instruments and the more notes you have in a mix, the more you compress because the mix gets too chaotic or busy. The second thing that determines the amount of compression is the style of music. Certain types of music, such as pop, are commonly more compressed. Now, after you stabilize the sound between the speakers, if you then turn up the overall volume, you can put the whole sound right in your face. 
This is commonly done in radio and TV commercials, which makes it sound louder, making it jump out and grab your attention. This might be annoying in radio and TV commercials, but it's great for a lead guitar or other lead instrument. If you want a lead sound right in your face, compress the hell out of it and turn it up. It also works when putting sounds in the background. The problem is that low volume sounds can easily be lost in the mix. They can be masked by other sounds in the mix, especially if the volume of the sound fluctuates. Let me demonstrate. If you have a sound in the background, sometimes you can't quite hear it that well, especially if it fades on. But then it comes back in sometimes, you hear the sand, and other times you can hear the sand. But if you compress it, you can hear every word they're saying, even if you're whispering. It never fades out. If you don't compress it, you really don't know what they're talking about. Other times, you really do know what they're talking about. So you see, if you have a low volume sound and you put it in the background, if you compress the hell out of it, you can set it down low, and still never lose it in the mix. It's always there because it's stable. There are two main knobs on compressor limiters commonly called threshold and ratio. Visuals are especially effective in explaining what threshold and ratio do. If volume is shown as a function of front to back, the sphere is bouncing back and forth like a VU meter. It will then come out and smash into the threshold and stop if it's a limiter. The difference between a compressor and a limiter is that a limiter stops the volume from getting any louder than the threshold itself. A compressor, on the other hand, allows the volume to get a bit louder based on a ratio or percentage. Check it out. If we set the ratio to 2 to 1, it will go this far. If we set the ratio to 10 to 1, it will only go this far past the threshold. A good starting point is to set the ratio to 4 to 1. This is so that it turns the volume down without squashing. A squash sound sounds like this. The truth of the matter is you can set the ratio wherever you like. But also true is the fact that most people who are just starting out can't hear the difference between ratio settings very well. Until you can tell, 4 to 1 is a good place to start. Now this is how you set the threshold. The thing is you don't look at the threshold knob. Well, you have to look at it for a second in order to get your hand on it. Then you look at the gain reduction meters, which show how much the compressor is turning the volume down. You turn the threshold knob until you get a maximum of 6 dB of gain reduction, regardless of the ratio setting. For some instruments like lead guitar or screamer type vocals, you can set the maximum level at 10 dB of gain reduction. These are the levels you can set it at so that you turn the volume down some without squashing it. Once you hear compression really well, set it the way you want. Until then, try setting the ratio at 4 to 1 and setting the threshold for 6 dB of gain reduction. Like compressor limiters, the function of a noise gate is to turn the volume down. Therefore, compressor limiters and noise gates are often packaged together in one box. The difference is that noise gates turn the volume down when the volume falls below the threshold. Noise gates have three main functions. To get rid of noise, to get rid of bleed, and to shorten the duration of a sound. One function of a noise gate is to put it on a guitar amp to get rid of amp noise when the guitar is not playing. You know, if you set a guitar amp up with major distortion and turn it up to 11, 
the amp makes a really loud when it's not being played. If a song were to end with a guitar solo, it might sound like this. Now if we set the threshold correctly, it will sound like this. This is especially helpful in the middle of the song so you don't hear the amp noise. The threshold of the noise gate is set so that as soon as the volume fades enough to hear the amp noise, it gets cut off. Be careful, of course, not to cut off any of the guitar sound. Another common use of a noise gate is to get rid of bleed from other instruments in the room. Gates can be especially effective on drums to isolate each drum. And it's especially important on a snare when you've got a lot of reverb on the snare. Check it out. When volume is shown as front to back and the volume falls below the threshold, the sound will disappear. Noise gates can also be used to shorten the duration of a sound. This can make a sound shorter, which can be used as a quite bizarre effect. The threshold on a noise gate should be set so that it cuts the noise or bleed, but doesn't cut the main signal. Before we continue, I should remind you that we're just giving an overview of the functions of each piece of equipment in the studio at this point. The idea is to explain each piece of equipment visually so that in the next video we can use these visuals to show different types of mixes. We'll then go into more detail in each piece of equipment in future videos. As you can well guess, we could do a whole video on EQ alone, and we will. We'll begin our discussion of EQ by covering the differences between types of equalizers. Next, we'll explore all of the different frequency ranges between 20 and 20,000 hertz. What about the other ones, the higher ones? EQ is a change in the volume of specific frequency ranges of a sound. It's the same as the tone controls on a normal stereo, bass and treble. Now there are three main types of EQ found in the studio, graphics, parametrics, and roll-offs, high-pass and low-pass filters. You all know what a graphic EQ looks like. It has a volume control for each frequency. You can turn a frequency up or down using the volume sliders. Visually, we'll show frequency as a function of up and down, so we have low to high frequencies here. We're showing the volume of a particular frequency as the brightness in that band. For example, if you turned up the highs around 5,000 Hz, you would see it get brighter in that frequency range like this. On a graphic EQ, you choose which frequency you will turn up or down by putting your finger on the correct slider. On a parametric EQ, you turn the frequency sweep knob in order to select the frequency that you want to turn up or down. Besides a sweep knob, a parametric also has a bandwidth knob, which controls the range of frequencies that are to be turned up or down. On a graphic EQ, when you choose a particular frequency to turn up or down, you're actually turning up or down a range of frequencies preset by the manufacturer. Engineers, being the control freaks they are, 
want to be able to control the range of frequencies they are turning up or down. With a parametric, the bandwidth knob gives you this control over how wide the frequency range is. The knob's usually called Q because they couldn't get the word bandwidth on the knob. A thin bandwidth is normally labeled with a peak, whereas a wide bandwidth is often labeled with a hump. Sometimes ranges of musical octaves are also used, for example, three-tenths of an octave to three octaves. The obvious advantage of a parametric is the control you have over the bandwidth. If a parametric doesn't have a bandwidth knob, it isn't a full parametric, unless you're a salesperson in a music store. These days, many manufacturers are using the term parametric to refer to a paragraphic or semi-parametric which has no bandwidth control. Those bandwidth controls are expensive. Roll-offs roll off low or high frequencies. They are commonly found on major consoles as high-pass and low-pass filters and on smaller consoles as switches. A high-pass filter rolls off the low frequencies and does nothing to the highs. It passes them. It only rolls off the lows. This is especially helpful to get rid of low-frequency sounds such as trains, planes, trucks, air conditioners, earthquakes, or bleed from bass, guitar, or kick drum, and serious foot stomping. Low-pass filters roll off high frequencies like this. These are especially helpful for getting rid of hiss. Roll-offs can often be found on microphones and smaller mixing consoles like Mackie and Soundcraft as switches that simply roll off lows when the switch is engaged. It is important to get to know all of the frequencies of sound by name. You see, the truth of the matter is that we know all of the frequencies from 20 to 20,000 hertz by heart. Our entire system, our entire psyche was designed to perceive sound. Not only our ears, but every cell in our body is designed to perceive frequencies. Here's a picture of a water molecule inside a cell of our skin reacting to certain frequencies. Actually, when we hear sound, every single molecule in our entire body is creating a pattern based on the sound coming in. This means that our entire body is perceiving sound, not just our ears. You see, we were born to hum, <laughs> to sound that is, our entire body and being was created to perceive sound. Therefore, we all know every single frequency by heart. We've been checking them all out since the womb. We know all frequencies and pitches intimately. The trick is to learn their names. We'll get into more detail on all of the frequency ranges and how to remember them in future videos. Then you'll be able to remember what boosting or cutting each frequency does to each instrument in the world. Specialists don't seem to agree on how different frequencies affect us emotionally. Quite understandable because of the subjective nature of frequency perception. Psychologists to philosophers have written books about how sounds affect us emotionally and how people have organized their ways of perceiving difference in frequency. Different frequencies do affect us differently, both physiologically and psychologically, not to mention spiritually. However, even more powerful than the way specific frequencies make us feel is the way that combinations of frequencies make us feel.
truth of the matter is that each and every sound, except a pure tone, is made up of a combination of tones of different frequencies and different volumes. These harmonics or overtones account for the differences in why one sound sounds different from another, a sound's timbre. Different sounds have different harmonics in them, and more or less harmonics as well. The interesting thing about harmonics is that they are all mathematical multiples of each other, and each individual harmonic is a pure tone. Therefore, when we raise or lower the volume of one frequency or another, we're actually raising or lowering the volume of one or more of the harmonics in the sound. This accounts for why each sound responds to EQ differently. Once in the mix, sounds should be EQ'd so that they work well with each other. Sounds can be made to sound more similar to each other or more dissimilar. A lead instrument might be made to be more cutting and abrasive so it really grabs attention. An instrument might be given extra bass to make the song more danceable or just to excite the rap listener. There's an important technique that you might find helpful for checking the relative equalization of each sound in a mix. First, scan the high frequencies and check the relative brightness of all of the sounds in the entire song. Make sure that all of them are as bright as you want them. Often they should have a similar amount of brightness, but sometimes you want some sounds to be even brighter than others. Sometimes, you might want them to be duller than others. Second, scan the mid-range frequencies and check for the relative volume of mid-range frequencies across all of the instruments. Mid-range frequencies kind of stick out when boosted a lot. Make sure that all of the instruments have the amount of mid-range frequencies in them that you want. Just like highs, Often they should have a similar amount of mid-range frequencies. However, sometimes you want some sounds to stick out more and grab your attention. Third, scan the bass frequencies and check for the relative volume of bass in each sound that hangs out in the bass range. For example, check the relative amount of bass frequencies present in the kick drum compared to the amount of bass in the bass guitar. Check it out and make sure that it's the way you want it to be. This frequency range is the one that is most commonly missed when mixing an album or project. This has been an introduction to EQs and equalizations. Check out future videos for more detail. A delay stores a sound on a chip and then plays it back at whatever time you like. The delayed signal can also be fed back into the input to get the well-known sound of feedback or regeneration where the signal repeats. Just as you need to learn the details of the frequency spectrum, you must also get to know how each delay time feels. It's the type of feeling or emotion that different delay time ranges evoke that you use to remember differences in delay times. We can also use the relationship between delay time and distance in the studio to help us to get to know different delay times. Sound travels close to one foot per millisecond. One, one thousand, thousand milliseconds, milliseconds equals, equals one, one, one second. second, second, second. That means for every one foot in the studio, you're adding one millisecond of delay time. Therefore, it's very easy to hear a delay between two mics set at different distances. We can show how different delay times look quite clearly. Here is 500 milliseconds. 
Here is 100 milliseconds of delay time. Here's 40 milliseconds. Now when we have a delay time less than 30 milliseconds, an unusual thing happens. Our ear and brain are not quick enough to hear two sounds. Our ear perceives this quick of a delay time as one fat sound. This effect is one of the most important and useful for a recording engineer. Any instrument can be made into stereo with fattening. It can be used to fill out a mix so as to make it sound fuller. It can be used to make an otherwise wimpy sound sound fatter, fuller, and bigger. It can also make a sound more present so that it can be turned down in the mix but still be discernible. Now if we pan the original dry signal to one side and the delay to the other side, the sound seems to be stretched between the speakers like this. Now if we add feedback to a sound, the sound repeats itself like this, 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 this. What's happening this, is the this, output this, of the delay, this, this, the this, echo, this, is being this, fed back this, into the this, input this, of the delay this, this, to be repeated this, again. This, this. Adding a delay to a sound is the same as adding another sound or instrument to the mix. Therefore, it will always tend to make the mix seem fuller because there are more sounds to occupy the limited space between the speakers. You normally add delays to a mix only if you have room for them. Therefore, you wouldn't add delays to a very busy mix with a lot of instruments and a lot of notes. The exception would be heavy metal, alternative rock, and some new age music. These styles of music are commonly mixed to create a wall of sound. Therefore, to add another sound to fill this space can be just awesome. Yeah, Phil Spector. Yeah, he created that wall of sound type mix. Rules. When the delay time is long enough to hear two sounds, then the delayed signal can be treated just like another track, another sound. Therefore, the volume and panning can be set any way that you see fit. The sweet as the sweet any, as any harmony. harmony, but you mm, blinded but you me with science, and, mm, mm, and failed me and in failed biology. Me in biology. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you set the delay time for less than 30 milliseconds and crank up the feedback, you get an effect called tubing. Totally tubular. If you then change the delay time, you get an effect that sounds like this. If we set a clock to change the delay time on its own, we get the effect commonly called flanging. Notice that as the delay time gets shorter, the pitch seems to rise. As the delay time gets longer, the pitch seems to fall. Now if we set the width or depth so that the sweep of the delay time is not so wide like this, then we have the effect commonly called chorusing. It's poetry in motion. She turned her tender eyes to me. As deep as any ocean. As sweet as any harmony. But you blinded me with science. Mm. And failed me in biology. Yeah. If we set the delay time so that we are only sweeping between zero and one milliseconds, we have the effect commonly called phasing. It's poetry in motion. She turned her tender eyes to me. As deep as any ocean. As sweet as any harmony. But she blinded me with science. Hmm. And fell me in biology, yeah! <laughs> All of these effects, flanging, chorusing, and phasing, are just changing short delay times with lots of feedback or regeneration. In 1957, Tony Fisher was doing an album when someone accidentally leaned on the reels of the tape player like this. The tape slowed down and then when I got back up, it sped back up to normal speed, like this. The band went, cool, let's put it on the record. The song, The Big Hurt, went to number three on the charts in 1957. Now you can also change the speed or rate of the flange, like so. 
You could set the rate of the sweep to the tempo of the song. Or you could set it so that it is rising on one chord and going down on another chord. Or you could even set it so that it rises on the first half of the verse and falls on the second half of the verse. Flanging is commonly used to create a more spacey type of mood in the mix, sometimes used to create an otherworldly effect. It's great for the underwater type of effect. Chorusing is commonly used to simulate the effect that you get when you have a chorus of people or a chorus of instruments. Phasing is a very subtle effect, so subtle that it's the kind of effect that when used at Grateful Dead concerts, the crowd often wonders if the effect is actually coming from inside their head. I thought it was inside my head. Each of these effects can be panned in various ways, like this. Each can also be brought out front with volume. And raised or lowered a little bit with EQ. We'll explore more details about these effects in future videos, including how they are commonly used in mixes for different styles of music. Reverb is made up of thousands and thousands of delay times. When you first hear a sound in a room, the sound continues traveling out at around 700 miles per hour and hits the walls, bounces back from the walls, all at different distances, and comes back to us as hundreds of delay times. All of these delay times wash together to make the sound we know as reverb. When we place reverb in a mix, it's just like we are placing the sound of a room between the speakers. Therefore, we'll show reverb visually as a room or cube between the speakers. There are certain parameters of control that are commonly found in reverb units. First, you can change the type of room. You can think of it as different types of rooms between the speakers like this. Halls. Rooms. Chambers. And plate reverbs. You can also change reverb time, the duration of how long the reverb lasts. Long reverb time would look like this.
a short reverb time would look like this. When a sound occurs, it takes a while for the sound to travel out and hit walls before you hear the reverb come back. This time of silence before the reverb begins is called pre-delay time. A really long pre-delay time would look like this. It's poetry in motion. She turned her tender eyes to me As deep as any ocean As sweet as any harmony But she blinded me with science mm. And failed me in biology Yeah But a natural room, like an auditorium, has a short pre-delay time that would look like this. Another setting of reverb is the envelope. That is, how the reverb changes its volume over time. Normal reverb has an envelope that looks like this. Engineers, being the bored people they are, thought to put a noise gate on this natural reverb, which then chops it off. Therefore, the volume stays even then stops abruptly, like this. Ha! It's poetry in motion She turned her tender eyes to me As deep as any ocean As sweet as any harmony But she blinded me with science mm. And failed me in biology, yeah. <laughs> it's poetry in motion. She turned her tender eyes to me. As deep as any ocean. As sweet as any harmony. But she blinded me with science. Mm. And Now, if we were to take the envelope of normal reverb and turn it around backwards, the volume of the reverb would rise, then stop abruptly, like this. <laughs> it's poetry in motion. She turned her tender eyes to me. As deep as any ocean, as sweet as any harmony, but you blinded me with science, mm. and failed me in biology, yeah. Now, if we were to take the tape 
and play it backwards, it would sound like this. Now, if we put reverb on the vocal and record it on some open tracks, then turn the tape around to run forward, we'll get an effect like this. This effect is called preverb. It's the most evil effect that can be created in the studio because only the devil could put an effect on something before it even happens. Therefore, it has been used in every scary movie made, including The Exorcist and Poltergeist, and of course, it's Ozzy Osbourne's favorite effect. It can also be fun as hell, too. One of Reverb's main functions is to connect sounds in a mix and fill in the space between the speakers, like this. Like any sound, reverb can be panned in various ways, like this. Reverb can also be brought out front with volume, or placed in the background by turning down the volume. And it can be raised or lowered a little bit with EQ. We have covered volume changes, panning, EQ, compressor limiters, noise gates, delays, 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 delays flanging, phasing, chorusing, and reverb. Now that we have covered each piece of equipment in the studio, we can now use these visuals to show different classic styles of mixes in the next video. Hi, in this videotape, we're going to get down to business. We'll use the visual framework that we've outlined in the first two videos to explain how to create different styles of mixes. This is mixing theory. Plato and all those Greek dudes wrote myriads of books on a wide range of art forms including music theory. 
Mixing, on the other hand, is a new art form. You could say it's still in its adolescent form. You see, we've only had stereo for about 30 years. We have a lot of books that explain what all the equipment in the studio does, but there are virtually no books that try to explain the aesthetic side of what makes a great mix. Hardly anybody has tried to even approach the whole world of artistic values, perhaps because it's so fraught with different people's values. The normal process for learning to make a great mix is through experience with recording each style of music. First, you learn the tools and how they're used in each style of music. But you might have gotten to the point where you begin to wonder why your mixes don't sound like CDs. And you know professional engineers are getting great mixes every time. Certain professional engineers command extremely large fees because they are capable of coming up with something that most people perceive as great every time. So what is it they're doing? It isn't magic. They're doing some very specific things. Now that we have a framework for explaining what is done in a mix, we can now explore these things that engineers are doing to make such great mixes. This video is designed to help you discover these high-level values that major engineers have. Because you see, once you understand what these other guys are doing, you get a good perspective on what can be done. Then you can do whatever the hell you want, based on your own values. In order to determine what makes a great mix, we must first determine what you can do in a mix as opposed to what you can do during the recording session. There are a wide range of aspects that contribute to a good recording besides the mix. The mix is only one of a number of aspects. If any one of these components isn't happening, then it will stick out like a sore thumb and say, mix sucks. The professional engineer will often help the band refine all of these aspects during the session. We'll cover how to refine each of these components later on in aspects of a recorded piece of music. The mix is only one of all of these components. There are four types of tools that you can use in a mix to create all the different styles of mixes in the world. The tools are volume faders, pan pots, equalization, and effects. The question is, what can we do with these tools? As mentioned in the previous video, the equipment in the studio, the art of mixing is the way in which the dynamics we create with the equipment in the studio interface with the dynamics apparent in music and songs. So what are the dynamics in the music? When we speak about dynamics, we're not talking about common terminology used for volume dynamics. We're not talking about changes in loudness. We are talking about changes in intensity, musical dynamics, any type of change in the music that causes a change in a person. Well, the dynamics in the music are as different as people are. That which comes from music is as varied as life itself. Some people feel very strong emotions when they hear some types of music. Probably the most common dynamic that people see in music is simply up or down. Whatever the content of the up or down is, this is a common perception around music. Some people see structure in music, and sometimes they relate these structures to common structures found in the world, such as buildings, bridges, and pyramids. Some people actually see the workings of the brain in a song. They see the way in which our minds work as being the same as the flow of the song. Some people even think of songs as thought forms. In fact, some bands write their music in this way to represent the way our brains work. This explains the common theory that music is just an extension of our personalities. We've got it backwards, Grasshopper. The music came first. You are an extension of the music. 
some people relate to music through music theory. They see notes on a scale, they see intervals, they see chords, they see the structure of the song in musical terminology. Some people have physical reactions, like dancing. Not only does music move us physically, but there's also a whole world of music therapy based on the healing vibrations of sound. Some people see visual imagery. Walt Disney saw all kinds of things, including flying elephants. Just check out MTV to see a whole nother world of visual imagery. You might say, I see bubbles. Some people see spiritual connotations. The whole world of religious music is a good example. Some people see some music as a direct connection to God. There's a wide range of possible dynamics that music evokes in different people. Different people get different things out of music. It's true. All of the things that people get out of music are as varied as people and life itself. The trick is for the recording engineer to create musical dynamics with the equipment that match dynamics that people see in music, whatever those dynamics might be. Everything that you could possibly think of as to how music affects you or anyone else is valid. Anything anybody gets out of music is real. The art of the engineer is to enhance or bring out those musical dynamics even more with the equipment in the studio. Now, what are the dynamics that we can create with the equipment in the studio? With volume faders, pan pots, equalization, and effects. Let's start with volume faders. For those of you who are of a mind that would like to follow the overall structure of the presentation, let us show you a graphic of how it is all organized. We will be going through each of the tools in the studio. Volume, EQ, panning, and effects. As we go through each one, we will explain the dynamics that can be created with each one based on, first, the difference between individual levels or settings for that piece of equipment. Second, the overall patterns that can be created between the relationships of all the sounds in the mix. And third, what happens when you move the knobs during the mix, an especially effective dynamic. As I was saying, Let's start with volume. The question is, what kind of dynamics can we create with the relative volume set by the faders on the console? Most people first think of the dynamics that you can create by moving the faders during the mix. In fact, this is an extremely powerful dynamic. When you change the volume of sound during a mix, you can create a dynamic that is so powerful that it can overwhelm the song. The movement of the fader can be such a strong dynamic that it becomes the primary focus of the entire mix at that moment. But even more importantly, there are somewhat more subtle dynamics that are created just by simply placing the volume of the faders at specific levels and leaving them there. Most people think of balancing the volume of sounds to mean to make them all even. The process is actually much more complex. Often we don't want all of the instruments to be the same volume. We normally want one instrument to be a bit louder than another. In fact, the exact volume relationships between each sound in a mix are very specifically set by a recording engineer. For example, a lead vocal will come across completely different if it is extremely loud in the mix. That is, if it is way out in front of the rest of the mix. Both the singing and the message being transmitted by the lyrics will be perceived completely differently depending on how loud the vocal is in the mix. And you see, 
This is a dynamic that the engineer controls by where he places the fader in the mix. Actually, the musical dynamics that can be created with volume relationships are much more complex than you might have ever imagined. In fact, traditions have evolved for specific volumes of particular instruments for different types of music and songs. Let's explore them this way. Now remember, we're discussing relative apparent volumes. You see, the, you see, the apparent volume of a sound is also dependent upon the waveform of a sound. For example, a chainsaw sounds louder to our ear than a flute, even if they are both exact same volume. So the apparent volume is the level that sounds seem to be to our ear. If we think of volume in decibels, based on sound pressure level, then there are around 140 different levels of volume. But in order to make this wide range of levels more accessible, let's divide them into six different levels like this. If we take a look at a mix and divide it into six ranges of volume, these are the instruments that we commonly find at each level. Level 1. Sounds at this volume in mixes are unusually loud. In fact, it's quite rare that sounds are ever at this level. The alarm clocks in Time from Dark Side of the Moon, by Pink Floyd's a good example, explosions and primal screams can also be this loud. Normally though, if an inexperienced engineer places a sound at this volume, it's thought of as an error. Level 2. Sounds at this volume are normally lead instruments and vocals. However, certain songs and types of music will put the vocals here. For example, big band music and middle of the road Barry Manilow type of music. Also, if the vocals or, lyric or lyrics are the main focus of attention, like in Bob Dylan, they might put the vocals this loud. Likewise, if a song has a great singer, his or her vocals are often placed at this level in the mix. Other instruments found at this volume might include the boom in rap music, or the kick drums or toms in heavy metal, horn blasts in big band music, and symphony blasts in classical music often reach level two. Level three, sounds at this volume normally consist of primary rhythm parts, such as guitar or some type of keyboard. Lead vocals in a lot of rock and roll are also set at this level. Other examples include kick drums in most heavy metal, snare drums in most dance music, most toms in most styles of music, and cymbals, with hi-hat only occasionally at this level although jazz and dance music often place it here. Phil Collins is probably about the first person to place reverb on the drums at this level, level three. Level four. Sounds at this level include rhythm beds and chordal pads such as background piano, keys, or guitar. Drums in a lot of jazz, middle of the road, and easy rock are also at this level. When reverb is noticeable as a sound on its own, it's normally here. Background vocals and strings are also often at this level, but of course they can vary. Level five. Sounds at this level include things like the kick drum and jazz and big band music. Lots of effects and reverb often get placed here so that you can only hear them if you listen closely. Background vocals sometimes also get relegated to this level. Some producers also use this level to make their mark. Level six. Sounds at this level are so soft that they are hard to detect. Pink Floyd is famous for adding little whispers or almost subliminal sounds to draw you into the mix. Sounds at this level can be very effective, but it's important they serve to add to the overall mix in some way. If these sounds do not fit just right, they can sound just like noise. This chart of the six different levels has only been presented to give us a framework so we can now explore all the different levels for each instrument in different styles of music. As you will see, different instruments are commonly placed at different levels. Let's take a look. Now 
Now, as previously mentioned, different styles of music have developed their own traditions as to the volume that particular instruments are placed within a mix. Let's look at each type of sound individually. What about vocals? Let's take a look at various examples of vocals being placed at different levels in the mix. Think about it. Vocals are commonly mixed at different levels for different types of music and for different types of songs. For example, probably the loudest we hear vocals is a cappella. <laughs> Just kidding. Vocals are commonly quite loud in middle of the road music. I got it back. I got it back. And that ain't good. Of course, in opera, the vocals are also quite loud. The vocals are commonly mixed loudly in folk music as well. I'm a guitar man. Whoa. I'm a guitar man. Whoa. I'm a guitar man. And in big band music. So when you hear it thunder, don't you run under a tree. There'll be pennies from heaven for you and me. Don't you know there's bound to be pennies from heaven for you and me. And in country music. So baby, just leave me and say goodbye. Come on now, let me go, babe. Come on, baby, now let me go. Besides the style of music dictating the level of vocals, the song can also make a big difference. Songs where the lyrics are the focus of the entire song often have the vocals mixed right out front. Bob Dylan's a perfect example. On the other hand, think of examples where the vocals are mixed quite low, as low as level four even. An example of vocals being so low are those in songs by Enya. Commonly, vocals are mixed quite low in a lot of types of rock and roll. Perfect example is Pink Floyd or any alternative rock. Besides the style of music, there are a number of reasons that you might turn the vocals up or down in a mix. If they suck, you normally shouldn't put them out front. Whereas if they're great, show them off. Now, what about snare? Same as with vocals, the volume that a snare is placed in a mix is dependent on the style of music and the song. Big band music and jazz often have the snare mixed quite low, as low as level Just four. Ask me if you're in doubt, cause I'm hip. Now I'm deep into Zen, meditation, and macrobiotics. As soon as I can, I intend to get into narcotics. Cause I'm cool. It is also interesting to note that a lot of easy rock and ballads commonly mix the snare quite low. However, some ballads do have a massive snare sound turned up quite loud. Rock and roll is probably most responsible for the snare's progression up the volume scale. But in the 60s, dance music and then disco helped to raise the level of the snare even another level. These days, some types of rock and roll have the snare as loud as level two. Now check out kick drums. Again, 
the style of music makes the biggest difference. Big band music and jazz commonly have the level of the kick drum down around level four or even level five. It's also interesting that even a lot of Jimi Hendrix's music was mixed with the kick drum down around level four so that you could hardly hear it. Another interesting thing is that over the last 20 or so years, the kick drum has made its way up the scale, becoming louder and louder in mixes. Heavy metal was probably responsible for raising the kick drum up a whole level. Heavy metal commonly places the kick drum up around level two. Rap and now hip hop have almost taken it off the top of the scale. Yeah! <laughs> now, let's take a look at volume levels of bass guitar. Bass guitar started out barely in mixes at all. Sunday morning, uh -huh. there lies a body. Just in big band, it was down around level three or four. In a lot of jazz, it's actually now quite high, close to level two. Even in a lot of rock and roll, the bass guitar is not as loud as many people often think, although it does vary a lot. Began a revolution. One MC with a speedy DJ, creating the beats with a funky bass line. The into congruence, along with my rhyme. The rhymes are flowing, the beats are growing. They said it couldn't happen, but now I'm showing. Showing what it takes to make it in this world of music. So now I got to use it now. Back to the jumping, gotta stop slumping. Cause you know we gotta do something. Make this party. It's Check it out. Even Peter Gabriel has a rap boom on his last album. Not only did rap help to raise the level of bass guitars in mixes, it has also even changed the hardware. When you go to a stereo store, you see things like mega bass and, of course, boom boxes. And stereos are now capable of handling a lot more bass than in the old days. It's also interesting that reggae and the blues often have the level of the bass quite a bit louder than in other styles of music, sometimes as high as level two. Commonly, the fewer instruments in a mix, the louder the bass. This is probably because you need something to fill out the space between the speakers. If you have a lot of instruments in a mix, there just isn't enough room for the bass guitar. Also, a bass will mask the other sounds if too loud, so it is often mixed at a low volume to leave more space for the other sounds in the mix. What about toms? Toms are commonly mixed lower than most people think in most types of music. Toms are probably mixed low because often the bleed of the cymbals in the tom mics are annoying. A 
Effects also vary a lot in different mixes. Reverb has progressed up the scale over the years. In fact, it was probably Phil Collins and Genesis who were responsible for raising the level of reverb an entire level. Pink Floyd has just about taken over the title for having the effects the loudest in their mixes. Other sounds like hi-hats, cymbals, rhythm guitars, horn sections, and background vocals are also mixed at various levels depending on the song and the style of music. In fact, you might start checking out the relative level of every sound in every song the rest of your life. As you can see, you can create an incredible variety of musical dynamics based on the level that you set each sound in the mix. And each style of music has developed its own traditions for the specific level that each instrument should be set. Of course, for some styles of music, the traditions are stricter than others. Big band music and jazz are pretty strict, whereas the rules for rap and hip-hop are extremely loose. Also, of course, the song and all of its details can make a big difference as to the levels at which each sound is placed. And finally, the people you are working with can make a big difference. You can only argue so long with someone who's telling you to turn up their instrument or else. But do argue. Give them hell. Besides all of the individual volume levels of each instrument, there are dynamics that can be created with the overall relationships of all of the volume levels in a mix. We call these volume patterns. For those of you following along, we are now here on the graphic. In some styles of music, the range of volumes might vary only from here to here. New Age music, alternative rock, middle of the road music, country music, and easy rock are often mixed this way, such that there is very little difference between the softest and loudest sound in the mix. Muzak might be said to be the extreme example. All sounds are pretty even in volume, such that none ever jumps out and shocks us. This might be totally appropriate for a love song. On the other hand, some styles of music are mixed with extreme variations between the softest and loudest sounds like this. Commonly, lots of rock and roll is mixed this way. Also, big band music is a perfect example of this type of mix. You might have extremely soft sounds followed by huge horn blasts. Pink Floyd's well known for trying to shock the hell out of you with alarm clocks and explosions. It can be quite fun and exhilarating. Besides the style of music, the type of song can also make a big difference as to the overall range of volume levels. For example, a love song might be mixed quite evenly. A song about explosive behavior might be quite uneven. Here we are again. Volumes can not only range in dynamics from the softest to the loudest sound in the mix, but an individual sound can be raised and lowered within the song. Anytime faders are moved while a sound is playing, the dynamic created tends to be very intense. If the level of a sound is changed at a good transition point, such as the beginning of a chorus or a lead break, a dynamic's created, but it's not nearly as intense as when changing a sound while it's playing. Let me show you a magic trick. If you bring a sound out front by turning the volume up at the beginning of a song, you can then turn that sound down, and since we heard it so well, it will be clear in our brain what that sound is doing, even if it is then set back low in the mix. Then bring up another sound in the mix so we can check it out, and then bring it down in the mix, and once we hear a sound loud and clear, it doesn't have to continue to be loud in order to recognize it. If you keep doing this, you can create the illusion that all the sounds in the mix are loud and clear. Sometimes, of course, the volume of the entire mix can be raised or lowered. The overall volume can be cut or boosted or gradually faded. Such dynamics can be very effective, if appropriate, for the song. Besides moving a fader to create volume dynamics, 
Commonly, you need to adjust levels just to keep the volumes more even. An engineer often must constantly adjust levels up and down just to keep things even. Compressor limiters can only do so much before they make a sound sound unnatural. Therefore, another dynamic that can be created with the faders is to actually even out the volumes more by moving the faders throughout the mix. Oh, we're right about here now. Now, how can you create musical dynamics with equalization? Well, just as with volume faders, there's a large and complex world of EQ relationships between instruments in the mix. There are two main types of considerations that professional recording engineers use when equalizing sounds for a mix. The first is based on how the sound sounds by itself in solo, the primary consideration when first EQing the sound at the beginning of the recording session. This consideration is usually based on whether you are going for a sound that is natural or interesting. The second consideration is how the sound sounds in the mix relative to the other instruments and is of the utmost importance of the two. It used to be that engineers would go out into the room where the instrument is and listen. Then they would go back into the control room and compare the sound in the speakers to what they heard out in the room. However, these days, natural is defined by what is currently on CDs and the radio. You see, natural ain't natural no more. We have become addicted to crisper, brighter, cleaner, as well as fatter, fuller, and bigger. Therefore, to make sound sound natural can be boring and unnaturally dull by today's standards. What we hear on the radio and on CDs these days are much brighter and crisper than the real thing. Now, what we consider to be natural is an average of what we hear on the market daily. If it isn't bright enough, it won't be considered to be right. On the other hand, these days often the goal is to come up with a sound that sounds unique or interesting, not necessarily one that sounds natural. I mean, who knows what a natural piece of sheet metal sounds like anyway? The question is, what makes a sound sound interesting or unique? One thing that makes a sound interesting is the complexity of the sound. The more complex the sound, the more it can stand repeated listening. The more you listen to it, the more you hear. Oh, we're moving right along. We're right about here now. Structuring the relationship between the tonalities present in each of the instruments is an important aspect that a recording engineer deals with in mixing. As with balancing volume relationships, it's commonly thought that it is most desirable to have the EQ of all of the instruments as even as possible so that they blend well. Well, sometimes this is the case. However, it is often desirable for certain instruments in a mix to be unusually bright, dark, or mid-rangey. Commonly, sounds are mixed so they do work well with each other. Sounds can be made to sound more similar to each other or more dissimilar. A lead instrument might be made to be more cutting and abrasive so as to really grab attention. An instrument might be given extra bass to make the song more danceable or just to excite the rap listener. As previously covered in the second video on equipment, in order to simplify things, we can compare the relative EQ of each sound at each frequency range. We can create various EQ relationships at each frequency range, highs, mid-range, and lows. Although there are a wide range of possibilities for creating EQ dynamics, there's only so much you can do to be creative with EQ. Commonly the goal, especially for the beginning engineer, 
is not to be creative with EQ, but to get things just to sound normal, to sound right. Most people are glad if they can just get a mix to sound right. In fact, the boundaries of how creative you can be with EQ before it sounds weird is quite limited. If you go beyond these limits, you're normally no longer being creative. You just have a bad mix. The trick is to learn the limits so that you can be creative within the limits of sanity. The goal is to get to the point where you know the limits of creativity so well that you can EQ something a little off-center. You can make something sound a little strange as an effect. This is when you're truly being creative with EQ. It's funny. The problem comes when you create EQ that is a bit off-center from being exactly natural as an effect, and someone in the band complains that the instrument doesn't sound right. Not only should any unusual EQ be appropriate for the style of music in the song, but you can only do it if the band will let you, or if you can convince them how it works and how cool it is. We're right about here now. Because we are so limited as to how creative we can be with EQ, to make EQ changes in a sound while it is playing creates a dynamic that is extremely noticeable. If not appropriate for the song, this could be quite distracting. A good example of where this has been done well is in Aqualung by Jethro Tull, where the voice goes to a telephone-like voice. Pink Floyd also did it in Wish You Were Here, where the acoustic guitar goes into a little box type of sound. Currently, it is considered to be very unusual to actually change EQ settings during a mix. However, it just might be the next creative frontier, especially for those mixing hip-hop and the like. As we continue our overview of the way that you can use studio equipment to create different musical dynamics, we have evolved to here. As previously discussed, panning is mapped out visually as a function of left to right. The big question is what kind of musical dynamics can you create with the placement of pan pots on the mixer? If we think of the space between the speakers as a palette, and the sounds are the colors that we place on the palette, then panning can be based on crowd control. You might want some sounds to be panned as far from each other as possible in order to create clarity. Such a dynamic might be appropriate for certain types of music like acoustic jazz, folk music, and bluegrass. On the other hand, sounds may be panned such that they overlap in order to create a wall of sound, making the mix seem more cohesive. This is commonly done in heavy metal, alternative rock, and new age music. However, panning is often done based on certain traditions that have developed over the years, defining the norm for panning particular instruments. Also, particular styles of music have developed their own traditions for the placement of particular instruments left to right in the stereo field. In fact, it is almost like if you follow these traditions, you create a dynamic that is transparent and lets the music through more. Whereas if you don't follow these traditions, you create a dynamic that might call attention to itself. This is not to say that it's wrong to pan things differently than normal, but you should just be aware of the fact that you're doing it. It could actually be totally cool and appropriate and could change the world. As with fader volumes, some styles of music have stricter rules than others. For example, you can practically do whatever you want in hip-hop, whereas in big band music, it's important to set up your panning the way a big band would normally set up on stage. Acoustic jazz is also sometimes panned just the way the band would be on stage. An engineer will sometimes even place the musicians in the studio as if they were on stage. I've mixed some folk bands just exactly the way that they were standing out in the studio. Doing this helps you to create the illusion that you are there with the band, which can be a nice illusion. In order to obtain the most natural panning of a drum set, try this. First, pan the overhead mics on the drums completely left and right, like this. 
Then, listen for the left-right placement of each drum in this stereo overhead mix. Pan the mic of each individual drum to exactly where you hear it in the overhead mix. For example, listen to where the hi-hat seems to be in the overhead mix and place the hi-hat mic right there. Same with the toms. Listen to where each one seems to be in the overhead mix and place each tom accordingly. This will give you the clearest imaging you can obtain. You see, if the toms are here in the overhead mix and then you place the tom mic themselves over here, it's like you have panned the toms in stereo. If you place the tom mic right where they are in the overhead mix, voila! precise imaging of the toms in one place. However, these days, it's quite a bit more common to not pan the instruments as they are on stage. More and more people will pan them to wherever they sound the coolest. It's interesting to note the way that drums have been panned throughout the history of recording. The Beatles placed the vocals in one speaker and the rest of the band in another. Although this was a mistake, they meant for two tracks to be mixed down to mono when the record was made, but the mastering engineer decided to be creative. Many jazz groups have placed the entire drum set in one speaker. The advantage of doing this is that it leaves a huge amount of space between the speakers for the rest of the band. The big disadvantage is that the separation between individual pieces of the drum set becomes obscured. Now let's take a look at traditions in panning of particular instruments. Individual instruments have come to be commonly placed in specific positions from mix to mix. For example, it's rare that the kick drum is ever placed anywhere except in the middle. It isn't necessarily wrong to place it somewhere else, but it has become commonly accepted to be placed in the middle. This could be because a kick drum appears as a very large sound in the world of imaging. The kick drum has so much energy, it completely commands our attention. Also, when the sound is in the middle between the speakers, you have two speakers carrying the sound instead of one. Therefore, especially with big sounds like a kick drum or a bass guitar, the speakers don't have to work as hard, so it'll sound better. The snare drum is most commonly placed in the middle. Some engineers do place it a bit off to the side, especially in jazz, because the snare drum is off to one side in a real drum set. The hi-hat is often placed off to one side also. It seems that most engineers will place the hi-hat halfway between the middle and the left side, like this. However, if you are creating a mix that is meant to be more spatial, it might be appropriate to pan the hi-hat all the way to one side. Now, in house music and hip-hop, not only can the hi-hat be panned anywhere, it is commonly moving during the entire mix and is sometimes recorded with a delay on it. In order to provide maximum fun, tom-toms are commonly spread completely left to right. However, for natural panning, the rack toms are sometimes placed in the middle, just like on a real drum set. A floor tom is normally placed on the far right. However, occasionally the floor tom will get placed in the center for the same reason we normally put kick drums and bass guitars in the middle, because they are so powerful and command so much attention, and because it will sound better when both speakers are carrying the sound. The discussion of tom placement brings up an interesting question. Should the toms be panned from left to right, as if from the drummer's perspective, or from right to left, from the audience's perspective? It seems that those who do live sound commonly pan from right to left, just like in a live show. However, many engineers pan from left to right, just like we read. The other interesting thing is that a lot of people have very strong feelings about this issue. Bass guitar is most commonly placed in the middle as it commands so much attention. Jazz and similar types of music oftentimes place the bass off to one side. 
This is normally only done when the sound of the bass itself is thinner or the bass EQ has been rolled off, making the sound sound thinner. It's poetry in motion. Lead vocals are overwhelmingly placed smack dab in the middle. If they are recorded in stereo, doubled, sung twice, or made into stereo with an effect, the stereo effect is normally spread evenly left to right. A solo piano is almost always panned completely left and right in stereo just because it sounds so nice that way. Magical. If the mix is too busy already, that is if there are a whole lot of instruments in the mix, sometimes it's still panned in stereo. Sometimes it is panned in mono when the mix is really busy. The left-right placement is completely dependent on the placement of the rest of the sounds in the mix when in mono. Again, you can do whatever you want with individual instrument sounds depending on the style of music. This is just to let you know what is commonly done because a lot of people want their mixes to sound like what is on the radio. Any placement of individual instruments other than the above norms might be considered unusual, but it also just might be considered inappropriate. Besides individual placement of sounds between the speakers, even more important are the overall patterns you can create by panning in the overall mix. So, we are now here. With panning, you can create a symmetrical mix. Or asymmetrical type mix. Symmetrical mixes might commonly be created for a love song or ballad. It might be created for a song about balanced ecology of mind. Whereas an asymmetrical mix might be created for a song about psychotic, unbalanced behavior. Commonly, symmetrical mixes are used to create a balanced type of dynamic, whereas an asymmetrical mix creates a bit of tension. To get even more detailed, a balanced mix is often made to be symmetrical at each frequency range. For example, if a hi-hat is on the left, a shaker or acoustic guitar might be placed on the other side to balance the high frequency range. A guitar on the left might balance a mid-range keyboard on the right. Again, this is if you're going for a symmetrical mix. Creating balanced or lopsided mixes can be an especially effective dynamic when it is appropriate for the song. Movement of a sound from left to right during a mix also will create a very intense dynamic. So most engineers normally save such drastic creativity for special occasions. There are a number of ways that a sound can be moved this way, creating innumerable patterns of movement. Possibilities range from short, minuscule moves to full range and wide sweeping moves that go the full sweep from speaker to speaker, from pans that move slowly to pans that zoom back and forth between the speakers. Obviously, when it's appropriate for the song, this can be a great effect. Hendrix did it a lot, especially in crosstown traffic. Led Zeppelin went bananas in Whole Lot of Love. So far, we have covered three of the four tools that you can use to create dynamics in a mix. Volume, EQ, and panning. Now, what type of dynamics can be created with effects? Well, there's an incredibly wide range of effects, and the dynamics that they create range from very subtle to very shocking, mesmerizing, and world-changing. <laughs> It's just not within the perspective of this video to be able to go into all of the dynamics of each effect, including the wide range of variables that can be achieved by changing the parameters within each effect. 
but most of them are quite obvious. We all know what a reverb can do to a mix. We know what delays sound like. And if you don't know what flanging sounds like, try it out. It can be used to create very otherworldly type effects like being underwater. More details of specific effects will be covered in future videos. Now when you look at the overall perspective of how effects contribute to making different styles of mixes, one of the most important dynamics is how they fill out a mix, making it sound fuller and bigger, more like a wall of sound. By the way, we've just advanced to the next level. With delays, you're adding extra sounds to the mix. So there are simply more sounds between the speakers. With short delays, less than 30 milliseconds, you get fattening that appears to stretch a sound between the speakers, again, filling out the mix, making it bigger. Flanging, chorusing, and phasing are all based on short delay times, so they too will tend to make the mix sound bigger and fuller. And of course, reverb is actually made up of hundreds of delays, so it takes up a lot of space in a mix and really fills out the mix tremendously. All of these effects will make a mix fuller, bigger, badder. However, they also make a mix busier. Therefore, if the mix is already busy with a lot of instruments and a lot of notes, it could become muddy. Commonly, these effects are only used when you have room for them. That is, when there aren't too many sounds in the mix in the first place. However, there are times when you might want to make a mix even bigger, even though it's already quite full. This is quite common with heavy metal. With heavy metal and a lot of hard rock, the bigger, the better. The more powerful, the more awesome. Therefore, you might consider adding effects to such a mix, even if things are already crowded. 48 guitars might not seem clean and clear, but if it's so big, it can be really cool. Now, certain types of music are commonly mixed with very few effects in order to create a sparse mix where every single sound is completely separate from every other sound in the mix, and where each sound is easily distinguishable from all the other sounds in the mix. Bluegrass, acoustic jazz, and some folk music are commonly mixed this way. Steely Dan is a good example of this style of mixing. Very few effects are used to create as clean and clear of a mix as possible. These types of mixes are normally done with very few or no effects at all. On the other hand, many styles of music are commonly mixed with a good amount of effects to create either a massive wall of sound type of mix or to create a spacious or spacey type of mix like Pink Floyd. It was Phil Spector who was known for first creating these types of mixes. For the longest time, everybody was addicted to clarity. Then Phil came along, started adding more and more instruments to the mix, and started using reverb to really fill out the space between the speakers. His mixes were dubbed the wall of sound. These days, we've taken this concept to the extreme. Just how many sounds can we fit in this space between the speakers? A lot of space rock, heavy metal, hard rock, alternative music, grunge, and even new age are commonly mixed with a lot of effects. Now if we use the analogy of a mix being like the thoughts in your brain, a clean, clear mix would be like this. No! Some people might think of this as a very orderly brain, like someone who has all their thoughts in place. Now on the other hand, some of you might think of this as a boring brain. 
Now, I'm sure you would prefer the exciting activity of a brain that looks like this. Neurons firing all over the place. Large amounts of interactivity going on between the areas of the brain. A full or sparse mix might be appropriate depending on the type of person, the nature of the song, and of course, the style of music. Well, finally, we've now arrived at the last part of this section on effects. There are a number of ways that you can create movement with effects. First, you can simply turn up or down the amount of the effects in the mix. But you can also change the type of effect or change the parameters within each effect. Needless to say, when you go changing the amount of effects or the type of effects in a song, this dynamic becomes the sole focus of attention for the moment. Some groups like Frank Zappa, Mr. Bungle, and even Pink Floyd have gone to the extreme of creating songs that are based around changing effects. Also, the capabilities of doing this are becoming much simpler now with MIDI control of effects. You can create subtler differences between sections of a song but again, only if it's appropriate for the song and style of music, and if the people you're working with will let you. We have now covered all of the four tools that can be used to create dynamics in a mix. By using the tools together to create combinations of dynamics, we can create all the different styles of mixes in the world. Let's look at how they can work together to create really major dynamics. We can use all four tools to create an incredibly powerful dynamic. For example, say we're mixing a love song. We could set relative volumes even so that nothing jumps out and shocks us, so that the mood of the emotion is not disturbed, so that love can grow without distraction. We could set the EQ so that nothing is too irritating in the mid-ranges, so that everything is nice and bright, but not too bright, and so that there isn't too much bass to blow the mood. We could set the panning so that it's balanced like a love relationship should be. We could use very few effects such that the mix is clean and clear like all our minds should be when in love. And we could refrain from creating any unnecessary movement with the faders, pan pops, EQ, or effects so as to not spoil the mood. Using all of these tools together, we can create one intensely beautiful dynamic totally appropriate for the song. It's like being another musician in the band. It's like the equipment in the studio is your instrument. On the other hand, if we're mixing some rock and roll or even hip hop, we might set volume relationships to be quite uneven really soft sounds and then it jumps out and grabs your attention creating a very exciting dynamic fun not boring at all we could set EQ so that we get lots of highs and lots of lows and we could EQ some sounds so they cut through and are edgy in the mid-range making the whole mix jump out and grab your attention forcing you to dance and forcing you to smile we could set the panning to be unbalanced creating tension, and making the mix unusual. Let's have some fun. Rock and roll. We could add all kinds of different effects, making the mix interesting at every single moment. Let's not fool around. Let's change the world. Enough of the status quo. We could also have things zooming left and right with panning, volumes going up and down, EQ changing throughout the mix, and effects not only going up and down, but also the parameters of the effect changing constantly throughout the entire mix. When you pull them all together, we can create one hell of an exciting and exhilarating mix. These are two extreme types of mixes that we could create with all of the tools, all of the equipment in the studio. 
there are a million possibilities of dynamics between these two extremes, and all mixes in the world fall somewhere in between these two extremes. Now, one of the most powerful dynamics that a recording engineer can create is to first create a context. That is, create a mix where all of the tools are working together to create a cohesive style of mix. Then, without warning, completely change all of the parameters of the mix with all four of the tools to create a completely different style of mix. Yes did it with Owner of a Lonely Heart. They took a screaming electric guitar sound and in a single moment it breaks down into a 50s style recording of a drum set with dull EQ and mics 20 feet away. Then all of a sudden it's back to a screaming guitar synthesizer type sound that is extremely edgy. The sudden change in mixed parameters was quite affecting. Sting also did it with the song Englishman in New York. The song goes from a jazzy groove with a jazz style mix, very few effects, very clean sounding, to all of a sudden a huge drum sound with tons of reverb. Then all of a sudden we're back to the simple clear jazz mix. Awesome, exhilarating and quite interesting. Of course, you can only create such dramatic mixed dynamics if it's appropriate for the song. In fact, I'm always on the lookout for bands that have written songs where such cool dynamics are appropriate. This was obvi obviously one of Frank Zappa's favorite techniques. Mr. Bungle has taken the concept to the extreme. Every 30 seconds, the song in the mix changes completely. To do this can be shocking. It can even blow people's minds. It shows people that their reality is just an illusion, that it could all change at any moment. But best of all, it shows perspective. It shows people that they need not stay stuck in their current reality. They only need to put a different mix on the situation. All of the mixes in the world are created with just these four tools, volume, EQ, panning, and effects. Every mix for every style of music in the world is made up with these four tools and the wide range of dynamics that they can create. The art of mixing is the way the dynamics we create with the equipment in the studio interface with the dynamics apparent in music and songs. Now that we have covered all of the dynamics that you can create with the equipment, we can now begin to explore all of the different relationships between mixing dynamics and the dynamics that people perceive in music. However, we'll let you begin this lifelong exploration on your own. The last video in the series used the visual framework explained in the earlier videos to show and explain all the different types of mixes that a recording engineer can create. Particularly, it shows the traditions that have developed over the years for mixing different styles of music. In this last video, we have covered and you have learned about the wide range of emotional dynamics that are found in music, emotions, structures, physical reactions, 
visual imagery, and spiritual aspects. We then covered the dynamics that can be created with each of the four tools based on individual settings, patterns of settings, and movement. We showed how different individual volumes create dynamics. We introduced you to the six levels of volume and then covered how each instrument sound is placed at different volumes for different styles of music and songs. We showed the dynamics that can be created through different volume patterns such as uneven volumes versus even volumes. And we showed the dynamics created by moving volume faders in a mix. We then went through different EQ dynamics created by EQing individual sounds. We then covered the more intense dynamic created by the overall EQ or EQ patterns. We then discussed the intense dynamic of changing EQ during a mix. Next, we looked at the different traditions in panning different styles of music and the traditions for panning particular instrument sounds. We then covered the dynamics created by overall panning patterns such as symmetrical mixes and asymmetrical mixes. We advanced to the dynamic created by moving pan pots during the mix and showed different types of panning movement. We then checked out the dynamics created with individual effects such as fattening, flanging, and reverb. We looked at the dynamics you can design through various patterns of effects, that is, full wall of sound mixes versus clean and clear sparse mixes. We then went through the dynamics of changing effects in a mix. We showed various ways that effects are changed during a mix. We then explained how you can create different styles of mixes using the four tools, such as what might be appropriate for a love song or for a really cool chaotic mix. Using the four tools we showed the wide range of mixes an engineer can create. We then pointed out and showed the most intense dynamic of all to completely change the style of mix in a single moment. Finally we set you off on the journey of learning how to create all these dynamics with the equipment to best fit the dynamics in music and songs. This is the true art of mixing.